Okay, welcome back to the interview. Today we're going to do something a little different and talk to someone who's been involved in one form or another with the domestic violence industry in Australia for around 40 years. So, Mark, would you like to introduce yourself and give us a bit of background? Sure. Uh, my name is Mark Dignam. I'm an Australian, but I've been living in Singapore now for about six or seven years. And I've worked as a consultant for many years, but going back to the 60s, that would have been my first experience working with social welfare. Um, my father was very linked in with a lot of um, church-based charities in those days. So I'm going back nearly 50 years. So it was my first experience with um, crisis, crisis care, refuges, etc. is roughly, in, you know, roughly 50 years ago. Yeah. Um, I started working full-time um, as a new graduate in 1979, and for the first six years I worked in two um, NGOs. Both of them were inner city based, we had refuges, we had a lot of crisis care, and we dealt with all sorts of different types of people. Mm. Um, sexual abuse, DV, um, er other forms of crises, drug and alcohol, you name it. And we were quite linked in. We had a lot of agencies outside of the city which people were often referred to. And it was fairly common that we'd get DV cases, and this is going back to the late 70s. And the mentality, when I think back then, we didn't have concepts of social justice that are overlaid on um, domestic violence that we get now. It was very much seen that there was a problem to be dealt with. It was from dysfunctional relationships, dysfunctional families. Yep. And I think the current narrative where it's now violence against women, um, I think that there are two problems with that. Firstly, not only does it say that it's men versus women, mm. but also a large proportion of the problem when you're actually working in crisis care and you've got to sort a problem out is children. Yep. And they've been cut out of, the rela out of this equation completely. Mm. We don't hear now about family violence involving children. It's always violence against women. Yeah. So that narrative over the years has changed quite considerably. Hmm. So in, b when you first started out in 1979, there was really no... Um, it, it, it's about women only. It, it was just there's a problem, there's violence somewhere, and people need to be sorted out with accommodation and, and help. Yes, and we might, sometimes we might have to get you know, health services involved, sometimes the police involved if it was bad. Um, but we got cases of violence, uh, victims of violence, which were men, women, and children of all ages. Hmm. Now, even then, the general assumption is that it's more likely that the male is the perpetrator. Yeah. But we weren't in a situation where we were judging people based on, well, it must be your fault. There was no concepts of entitlement or, hmm. you know, patriarchy or um, oppression or systematic anything. We just didn't think about it from that point of view. Hmm. Was the Duluth model... I started model, noting... So, sorry, I was going to say, was the Duluth model that wasn't uh, in practice at that point? No, not, probably not by the late 70s. I don't think so. Hmm. Um, in those days, social welfare was organised from um, NGOs, a lot more so now that it seems to be based on government-funded organisations. Yeah. And in those days, the organisations that dealt with um, most areas of social welfare were not highly specialised. Hmm. So we would get all sorts of cases. And the first organisation I, I worked for, we had over 100,000 people on our books, and that's just in New South Wales wow. and predominantly in Sydney. So it is very common. Um, I've also had quite a few things over the years to do with Department of Community Services, and I've had personal experience with family members in that system too. Mm. And later on, probably moving on to, say, the 80s and 90s, we started seeing more the mantra of it's violence against women. Right. So I can give you some specifics about a case that I was involved in personally in the 90s where... Mm -hmm. um, it was violence against a daughter. There was a stepfather involved. 
but the court, even the testimony given at court, um, both the male and fe- both the stepfather and natural mother were complicit in the violence and abuse of the child. Right. I think was about twelve at the time. The male was arrested, and despite the fact that in a court the the mother. Uh, admitted to being complicit in giving evidence. She didn't cover it up. She actually admitted that she was complicit in it. Mm. Um, she was never charged. Uh. So despite... I've even got the transcript somewhere on... probably on a thumb drive somewhere from the court case. Mm. So I don't know whether that would have happened in the 60s or 70s, but certainly there's been a lot of changes along the way. Yeah. So... I noted probably from around about 1980 onward, it may have occurred a bit earlier, but I'm really only speaking from my own perspective. Yeah. I started seeing the feminization of a lot of social welfare organizations. Mm -hmm. So we started, the organization I worked for originally, we had probably more males working there than than women. Mm -hmm. Now, all of us had some form of qualification in social work or psychology or social welfare. And I noted probably in the next three or four years, the nature of the staff started rapidly changing. We started getting feminists involved and a lot of the social narrative started changing. Right. And that happened pretty quickly. So I'm trying to think of some of the political changes that, if I go back to 1983, we had Bob Hawke elected as Prime Minister. Yep. And from that, concepts of access and equity, positive discrimination, a lot of that ideology started being pushed from the early 80s. Mm. We also had the establishment under the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet of the Office for the Status of Women. Yep. And I saw both working in the health industry and then later on working as a consultant and the federal government had for a very, you know, like for 30 years been my major client. Right. A few agencies. I saw the feminization of a lot of the agencies and also the feminization of pretty well of federal government. Yeah. When I go back to thinking about it even 30 years ago, most of the people in senior roles were men. That's not the case anymore. Mm. In most areas related to health, welfare, whatever, in federal government, a large proportion of the people in middle and senior management roles are women. Mm. And they're quite feminized. I mean, some of the discussions I've had with them about victim blaming, about systematic oppression, it just I just want to go and headbutt a wall. <laughs> um, it's because their interest is not trying to help people. Mm. And that's the frustration. When I go back to thinking about working in, uh, welfare organisations, we had very little money. Yep. I mean, we used to end up buying things ourselves at times because we had no other alternative. Mm-hmm. It's a bit like sometimes that in hospitals. Yep. Uh, we had very little money. We had a lot of problems to deal with and not very much time and resources to do it. The industry in those days was not at all specialised. Mm-hmm. From the 80s onward, it's become progressively more specialised. So you don't have organisations where they do bits of everything. You now have um, pretty well a domestic violence bureaucracy that's built up, mm. and it's very interlinked with a couple of government agencies. So the agencies meet with um, various federal government agencies on a regular basis. And I've, in fact, for some years, I used to go to them. Right. So more and more we've seen the centralisation of both ideology and also a specialisation of the roles the organisations are involved in. Mm. Um, I did some consulting work um, about 10 years ago for the federal government on domestic violence, and it was probably one of the largest jobs they ever did. And by that stage, everybody within the federal government that I dealt with was female. Right. Um, Some of them were absolute feminists, and some of them were quite openly lesbians. Yeah. You know, so we, we went from having the old social worker model going back to the 60s and 70s where they were quite mumsy, if you know what I mean. Yep. Um, to having butch uh, lesbian feminists involved in social policy. And that happened relatively quickly. Yeah, it's not, uh, it's not surprising given, given where we are today. Um... 
But um, I, actually, I think I asked you this by email um, uh, before a few days, maybe yeah. a week ago. Um, and I asked you about the suppression of um, statistics about um, child abuse and, and more specifically child deaths um, by parents and that these statistics have been actively suppressed for at least a decade, I think, now. Yes, and, and they I, have been. And I, and, I, and I asked you, actually, could you speak to sort of this, how did, how did this come about? I mean, obviously, it's part of this, what you've just described, this part of this culture. That this, they have control of the information, and they're only going to let out what supports their narrative. Is that an ac- accurate characterization? Th- yeah, there's probably a handful of issues. One of them is the fact that a lot of the original data is collected by the states. Yeah. So the states have their own agencies and own political genders, and they often don't want to share with either any of the other states and particularly by the federal government. Mm. I, I tend to think it's true that with states in Australia that the only thing that stops them from killing each other is a, a mutual hatred of the federal government. <laughs> um, I know that, for instance, in docks in, in New South Wales that about 10 years ago they stopped publishing certain bits of data. Mm. And one of the reasons for that is they genuinely did not want people to blame docs for the problems. Right. Whilst that's part of the problem, it's also, it didn't suit a lot of the political narratives. Mm -hmm. So by, I would say, probably the the 90s, the narratives really started overruling um, reality. Mm -hmm. Now, what I was trying to say, my first experiences with domestic violence is it wasn't judgmental. Right. The agencies didn't run around and blame people. Hmm. Now, when we got to know people that would be coming back with some degree of regularity, we would then try and talk to them about what to do about the relationship. Hmm. But I can't remember people blaming this is because men are bad or women are bad. That that sort of mentality didn't exist. Hmm. Um, now, if you're even if you're female and you work in areas of TV in Australia, it is difficult to survive if you don't fit into a very tight narrative. Sure. Yeah. I found the same thing in academia. Mm. When I started in um, universities in Australia in the mid-70s, even by then, um, they were starting to become feminised and social justice warriorized, if that's the mm. right way of describing them. Sure. I mean, even even 40 years ago, one of the philosophy... Um, lecturers was uh, pretty much a separatist feminist right she really did she wouldn't be in a room on her own with men right you couldn't make an appointment to see her if you're going to be the only person (laughs) and she was very very nervous around men and you know worked on the concepts of you know systematic oppression Mm. so the more i think of what's happening in 2016 there hasn't been really as much change as we think. What's happened is that the mentality has overridden everything. It's mm. been one step at a time where the ideology has been there for some time. It's just become part of the furniture now. Yeah, it's mainstreamed. Yeah. That's interesting, isn't it? So it's interesting about the um, that philosophy lecture, uh, professor because it's the complete opposite today. If you're a man... It, if you if you're going to meet one on one with a female student in your office, you better make sure you have a glass office or that that door is open. It's very dangerous for a man these days to meet one on one with a female student. Yes, and there's also the myth of you know rapes on campus and so forth. Mm. And the crazy thing about that is most of the cases that are cited have proven to be fake. Yeah, but uh, that, did you? I don't know if you saw. Um, uh, Recently on the drum, now this ridiculous uh, university survey that was done by uh, the University Association of Women, and they came up with this ridiculous figure that 70% of women have been um, sexually harassed on campus. Now, of course, when you looked at the data, um, staring counted as sexual harassment. But, of course, this has kicked off Gillian Triggs, um, the Human Rights Commissioner, Mm -hmm to launch a national survey now into universities and you know so we again as you said before being behind america i think we're behind america by about five years with the uh, 
uh, university hysteria, you know, rape culture on campus. But it is coming, and they're going to yes. and they're going to show that they're going to tour Australian universities and show that um, completely debunked um, video uh, documentary. Uh, do you remember the name of that documentary uh, in the, that they showed in the United States? Supposedly, and it's been debunked. Uh, something like eighteen Harvard lawyers wrote a letter saying that this is uh, just a complete misrepresentation. But nonetheless, they're bringing it to Australia and they're going to tour Australia with it. So, I guarantee you, in the next twelve months, I didn't months, know it was coming to Australia. Yeah, I really didn't. In the next twelve um, months, that will be uh, hyped up. You can bet you. Sorry, mm. I uh, I took you off track. Well, there. no. Well, if that's happening, that that's a little bit of a shock to the system. I didn't realise it was getting that bad in Australia. Mm. It's not that bad in Singapore, but I'm starting to see even in Asia, um, even in China, as an example, uh, social justice warriors and feminists are hitting even Chinese universities. Mm. Yep. So that I didn't think was going to happen for a while, but it's now starting to happen. And probably in another five or ten years, um, you'll see a lot of social justice nonsense in in China. I don't know how the Chinese government will react to it. Mm. But I also taught at universities for 23 years. So a very large proportion of my life, I was either about 36 years actually, mm. I was either a student or a, a part-time uh, lecturer or tutor at universities in Australia. Right. And... I did teach a little bit of applied psychology, but I actually mainly taught business. Right. But toward maybe about the mid-2000s, say if I looked at, say, go back 10 or 12 years ago, by then the diversity officers in universities were starting to become quite, quite powerful. Right. And there was deliberate pushing, particularly in areas like business, economics, sciences, etc., to get more and more women into those areas. And male applicants were pretty obviously being discriminated against. Mm. You know, we had applicants with 20 years' experience in the field who were not offered jobs, and the jobs were given to people that had absolutely no practical experience in the, the topic area. Right. But, you know, because they were friends with somebody, mm -hmm. um, they ended up getting offered a job as a lecturer or um, even in the research roles as well. So that's really happened in universities over a progressive period of time. Mm. And I saw by the late 2000s, you know, like 2007 and eight. by that stage, the whole way of assessing students started being dumbed down as well. Really? But, yeah, it's been quite a progressive change. But the diversity officers at universities now are very, very powerful. Mm. You, you can't argue against them. It's like you release it. You release a tiger and there's no way of putting it back in the cage because it will just attack everybody who questions it. Yeah, um, yeah, that seems par for the course. I mean, diversity officer to me is a completely useless and uh, non-necessary position. I mean, diversity is probably the most overused word in the English language today. And yet it's just invoked as a positive thing without any evidence being asked for it. It's just, how can you be against diversity? Well, it's a bit of a meaningless term now. Yeah. When I studied psych, um, I did quite a bit of industrial psych. Mm. And if you go back to even the 50s, the research done uh, in Western Europe and in America showed that diversity of ideas is a good thing. Yeah. So you don't want to... Just employ people who are the same, all the same, because you won't have diversity of ideas. Mm. The outcome they were looking for was not diversity of skin colour or hair colour or gender or whatever, mm. which is what they're looking for now. It was diversity in how you think. That's the only diversity so that, they're, that they're not looking for today. The only, that's the no, only they're one. not interested in that. Yeah, because it's 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 strange to me. It's always strange to me that when they talk about diversity, say in uh, say in the United States, for for example, and it always means let's usually it always means let's get more African Americans in whatever roles. But I mean, you could look at anything from uh, church attendance or the way black people vote, and they are much more uh, conforming. They're much more. If you want diversity of ideas, 
the white population is going to give you much more diversity of ideas. And these minority groups mm. uh, have much less diversity of ideas, if that's what you're actually looking for. But as you say, they're not interested in diversity of ideas. They're just interested in a United Colors of Benetton catalog lookalike. That's all they want. Yes, but if you have the United Colors of Benetton catalog, you have to be very careful how you portray the African Americans, otherwise you'll get sued. Yeah. Um, the whole the whole term diversity has been hijacked and it's been perverted. Mm. I learned about it many years ago in psychology. From an industrial psych viewpoint, the outcome you're looking for is not about gender, race, whether you've got straight hair, curly hair, blonde hair, dark hair, brown eyes, blue eyes. That was not the objective. Mm. The objective was to try and look at different backgrounds, different learning, different experiences, because if you're looking at problem solving, if everyone looks at the problem from one point of view, yeah. you're fairly limited. Mm -hmm. If you have a range of views where you can use each other or well, bounce ideas off each other and, oh, I didn't think of that, that's been shown to be a very good outcome, right. to have diversity of ideas. But it's been totally hijacked so that the concept of diversity now, in Australia it means higher women, and from what I can work out in the United States, it means higher black people. Yeah or sometimes maybe higher um, Mexicans or Latinos, for example. Yeah. And possibly in, in, I was in the UK just before Brexit, and I think over there the idea of diversity, even BBC is a good example, oh, yeah. where they put quotas on how many non-white people are going to be hired. And in fact, there was a fuss made because their quota was set for non-white people was significantly above their population proportion. <laughs> so they were, in fact, not just applying a normal quota, they were, in fact, offering special scholarships yeah. um, where they were deliberately targeting people from non-white backgrounds. Yeah. You know, everyone, you know, Pakistan, Indian, North Africa, whatever, but anybody other than white people. Yeah, and even, um, I think... There was some, I wish I could remember it now because I saw the story. It was something like they wanted um, X percent by 2020 to be gay, lesbian, transsexual, uh, disabled. Um, something like 20 percent of the staff had to be mm. in one of these categories, which was weird because if you add up, I think, I mean, the, the statistics I've seen in the United States, if you add up trans, gay, by uh, lesbian, you get to about four percent, and uh, yeah. I don't know what disabled is, but it, it, it's it's just it seems to me the complete opposite of um, what we were supposed to be about. The sort of the Martin Luther King idea that you judge a person by the content of their character, but it, what we've, we've gone back to for some for some reason we've decided to divide up society into categories. Attacked by BLM if he was around now. Yeah, he would. Uh, as someone else put more recently, that um, it seems that Malcolm X, uh, early Malcolm X, won the day. I mean, if you look at what's happening today, Malcolm X won that won that debate, not Martin Luther, Martin, Martin Luther King. Given that you have African American students mm. on university campuses asking for segregated dorms, I mean that's happening now. And they're being given segregated dorms. Yeah, but uh, if there was one university that actually refused them. I forget who that was. Um, but, yeah, I'm, I'm sure as the... That's another thing. I don't know if you can speak to that, but this sort of massive growth in the administrative staff at universities and that they just give in to everything, to all the student demands. They've just got that's what they're largely there for. Hmm. If you employ diversity officers, they're like feeding an octopus. Those tentacles just go everywhere. <laughs> and I saw that rapidly happening in um, probably the last five to ten years in Australian universities. The diversity officers have become very, very powerful, and you cannot criticise them and you can't argue with them. Mm. Now, they will often have the job of reviewing applicants for jobs, even if it's got nothing to do with their office. <laughs> it might be academic appointments. They will rigidly fight people if they don't agree with them. Yeah. And it's 
once it's like what I was saying. Once you unleash this tiger, yep. it will bite you. Oh yeah, and you can't just get, happily go and lock it up and put it back in a cage, <laughs> because you are giving people a lot of power. Yeah. Um, the complaint that the academic staff often have at universities, and although I haven't done it for a few years, um, two of my best friends are full-time lecturers. Mm. And they're guys I actually went to uni with or work with for many years. And they're saying now that it's even a lot worse. It's just getting totally crazy. Mm. But um, from an academic perspective, you're judged more by whether or not you fit. Even the reviews that they will get or whether or not they will be tenured is largely based on whether they fit particular ideologies. Right. It's certainly not about how many articles they publish and how good they are in teaching or whatever. It's become a lot of non-academic side issues have become a lot more important. I think that, um, I think it was that Mizzou issue in America that really did bring it to a head, oh. but just how strange universities have become. Yeah. And that with that, um, what was her name? Jennifer Click, was it? Oh, yes. Is that her name? Yes. That uh, totally uh, crazy... Melissa Click. Melissa, Melissa Click. Click. Yeah. Yeah, that totally crazy ginger-haired woman. Mm. Um now, eventually they got rid of her, yeah. but it was a split vote. Mm -hmm. So it was a majority vote, but it was a split vote as to whether or not it was okay to assault people, um, demand others literally um, inflict violence on somebody who was mm. a reporter. Yeah. Um, you can just imagine if that was a group of white people demanding some black person be ejected or a woman be ejected from a, a certain, you know, a woman be ejected from a sports field where a bunch of guys were training or something. I mean, that, you would not hear the end of it. It would be... Unless uh, they were transgender. <laughs> it would be a national scandal. Uh, <laughs> I was actually just thinking of a good case of violence in Australia um, it happened about the end of last year, and I can't remember the name of the, the woman involved, but she murdered her estranged husband. Mm. And I found out through just a few contacts that the law firm that she used had contacted an American um, sort of feminist lawyer group in America to create the narrative of battered wife syndrome. Right. So... The idea of battered wife syndrome is a relatively modern invention. Mm. Now, the idea of a battered wife has been around probably since Methuselah. Yeah. But it wasn't seen as um, something that gives you the right to murder somebody. Now, the woman in Australia was convicted of murder on the basis that the court accepted that she was a battered wife and she got no jail time. Jesus Christ. Despite the fact she admitted to murder, yeah, it's, it's stunning, isn't it? But that, but that is the narrative, isn't it? I mean, uh, that feminists want to push that. Oh, yes, some women do commit domestic violence, but it's in self-defence. That's that's yes. the or, line. Well, it's a little bit like any case now of um, purported sexual abuse. Mm. Uh, the the narrative very much now is you have to believe people. Yeah. I mean. By that, I mean believe women. Yeah. So you can't question them. And normal concepts of jurisprudence and evidentiary um, disclosure and so forth in courts, all that's pretty well gone. Mm. If you rely on a... Well, I mean, the idea of a belief is something that there is no evidence. That's why it's called a belief. <laughs> if there is evidence, it's not a belief. That's right. So we've gone totally crazy with... Um, the way the legal system has been twisted and distorted. The case I was referring to, um, the law firm in Australia contacted a law firm in the United States and they constructed this case of um, battered wife syndrome. Right. Now, there was no evidence of the man who was killed ever having inflicted any violence. Right. And even the police, when they interviewed the woman, there was never any physical evidence. Um, it was really only reported um, when the lawyer started constructing the case. Now, that's a bit of a red flag. If yeah. there's no evidence, it's not reported, there's no 
um, evidence of hospitalisation or reports of violence to the police. None of that happened. Yeah. Yet the court basically said, look, you obviously, you know, killed, killed your estranged husband, but there was no jail time. She and it was let off on community service and a bond. It's unbelievable. Now, we've gone that far that even when we know person A kills person B, if it's a female, we will look to create a context around that. Mm. If we can create a case of whether it's battered wife syndrome or any other syndrome. Yeah, um, I think you brought up. Um, I think you brought up before um, in email. I think about Canada and what happened over there, and then there was the, of course, there was the Gian Gomeshi case, where yes. women actively colluded and lied and, and the the judge said so but then i don't know if you saw the more recent case where a judge there was a there was a just a he said she said um and the judge just took the woman's yes. side completely i know the case and he cited yeah. in his in his verdict he cited some feminist uh poet was wasn't poetry was it but it was an essay or something of a feminist, and he read that out. Now that course is being uh, that that case is being um, appealed, but I mean that that's horrific. Yeah. That it... well, what was so crazy about it is there was virtually no evidence to suggest a rape had actually occurred. Mm. All the evidence suggested, even from what the woman had said, "Oh, let's meet together for hot sex later on yeah. today." Mm. As if not only it was consensual, it was actually her idea in the first place. Mm. Yep. So it's really becoming quite crazy. Now, at least one thing, because the, the judge in that case was so idealistic, mm. there's a reasonable chance, I think, that he will win on appeal. Yeah. Mm. Um, that hasn't happened yet. And if it doesn't happen, that will be a, a major watershed for how oh. um, any sexual... Um, sexual assault cases are decided. Yeah, it's it's. I mean, it's just. I mean, what do you, what do you do if you're a guy? I mean, you have to literally film everything in your entire life, um, or, or you're screwed. I mean, if it comes down to this, um, if the woman says if the woman says so, then that's the truth. Then you really put yourself at risk every time you're alone with a woman, if you don't know her very well and you can't trust her. I mean, it's a very dangerous road to go down. And I think if you're a university student these days, mm. um, you need to be, I mean, if you're a male university student these days, you need to be extremely careful. Yeah, uh, there's a, a large movement in the United States now, which is don't date on campus. Yeah, yeah. Because it is simply too risky. Mm -hmm. And even if it's totally crazy and you've never even met the woman, yeah. The allegation once made is almost impossible to disprove, mm. and it won't stop the university from kicking you out. No. Even if you win on appeal, it'll cost you a fortune, probably a few hundred grand in legal fees, plus you're still kicked out of the university. Yeah. So, and you'll still go down in history as somebody who was um, accused of being a rapist. Yep. Yep. So, it really has become very crazy. I think probably by the 90s, I was starting to see um, a lot of radicalisation of the whole DV movement. And even probably 20 years ago, the idea of domestic violence was being systematically changed to violence against women. Yep. And I'll probably go to my grave saying the same thing. To me, it's not just about the way men are treated, but children are often the worst sufferers of domestic violence mm -hmm. and they're cut out of the equation completely they are not relevant anymore now that's again a feminization issue yeah where the idea of parenting and being a mother is not really that liked by a lot of feminists no so the focus is now completely on women it's not well it's obviously not on men but it's also been taken completely away from children yeah that's bizarre isn't it? i mean that that i think that exactly right isn't it i mean you're dealing with the people that push this narrative are not generally mothers nurturers uh women that uh, they may as you say some of them are lesbians a lot of them uh well all of them buy into the oppression narrative mm. they all buy into patriarchy and um so they don't have any affinity or empathy 
or experience of being mothers or family, and uh, it's not important to them. Now, I'll give you another area where death of very young children, particularly babies, is often underreported. Mm. Um, some researchers have indicated that co- what are called cot deaths. Yep. Um, they're normally e- explained by respiratory problems with like babies suffocating by lying on face down, for example, in a crib. Mm. Now, I'm not at all saying they don't happen. They do. But some researchers are now indicating that a proportion of the kids that are accepted as being dying as cot deaths were in fact suffocated. Mm. Um, the American data, I don't, honestly don't know what it is in Australia, but the American data is that of uh, deaths, family violence leading to the deaths of children, in 71% of cases, the mother is the perpetrator. Mm. So the mother is the killer. Yep. Now, the term infanticide only applies to women. Right. And it is murder of children, or particularly babies, but a male would not be charged with infanticide, only the mother can be charged with infanticide. Right. And infanticide comes with a lot of the social context that we've talked about. Mm-hmm. Oh, well, it's difficult, the pressure's on mothers yeah. and blah, 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 and then um, the lawyers might bring in things like postpartal depression or... Mm relationship problems to mitigate the responsibility so we're now seeing again violence of children on where the children are the sufferers and the mothers are the cause of the problem but the responsibility is moved away from them now i can give you personal examples of where the father was arrested um for violence against children when the father was not even there at the time (laughs) Again. Yeah, And again, this is one I was personally involved in. The father, in fact, was probably about 150 kilometres away at the time. Right. And the police turned up at his doorstep. Now, luckily, the, the child who was the victim of violence didn't die that day, but she could very easily have, had, it, she could very easily have died. Mm. It was more by good luck than anything else. Because rather than the police checking on the girl... They didn't do that. They went to the father's house, who was nowhere to be seen. Right. He had no idea any of this was happening, and he was 150 kilometres away at the time. Yeah. Okay. Now, they bought his story because they realised he had nothing to do with it, was nowhere to be seen. Yeah. But that didn't stop them from turning up at his doorstep and arresting him. <laughs> Now, the mother, who was the perpetrator of the violence, was interviewed by the police, but there are again no charges. Okay. Now, that case was some years ago, yep. but that situation now is becoming more and more common. Um, yep. There's more of an acceptance from the police, the courts, uh, the domestic violence industry that whatever happens, go and arrest the male. Yeah. Well, there, Even when the male is the victim. There's so many uh, cases in the United States where a male calls the police because his wife is throwing something at him or you know, stopping him from leaving the house or coming at him with some kind mm-hmm. of weapon. And the police arrive and they just arrest the male straight away. They don't ask questions. They just arrest the male. They put him down on the ground and cuff him, take him away. So there's, there's just no questions even asked. That's yes. the Duluth model for you, isn't it? Now, if I go back to the late 70s, I don't think that happened. Right. We talked to the police all the time, mm-hmm. and I don't think that was the mentality. I remember once having a natter. This probably would have been maybe about 1980 or something. Might have even been a bit earlier than that to a copper that dealt with DV. And he said, look, we really don't try and blame people. What we try and do is to actually separate them if they're fighting or whatever. Mm. But the police knew that these problems were dysfunctional relationships and often they went on for years. You know, they might be okay for short periods of time Mm. um, and they'd be at each other the whole, you know. So you might have one hitting the other and the other hitting back. Mm. Now, the way it works now, if the female hits a male and the male hits the female back, Mm. even if it's literally accidental, like, you know, swings his arm to stop being hit yep. 
he will still be arrested and still be blamed as the cause of the problem. Yeah. Okay? And that is common now. And I've talked to plenty of coppers over the years in DV as well. And now it's almost policy that the man is seen as the culprit. Yeah. And that's where you're getting the narrative of it's violence against women, not domestic or family violence that was considered previously. Yeah. Um, and again, going back in the, the old days, the charities that I work for, uh, one of the first things we used to try and do was to find accommodation for children to try and separate them from violent relationships. Mm. Often the kids would be almost just in the wrong place at the wrong time. Yep. And sometimes the kids would start crying or start screaming or whatever they'd do, and then they would get hit. Right. And they could get hit by the mum or the dad or both of them. Yeah. Well, there's so, that famous um, statistic that um, uh, the White Ribbon, or what's his name, Flood, the chief researcher over there, um, he came out and said that something like 20 or one in four children have seen their father hit their mother. Um, oh, yeah. But And then the exact same statistic for women. Like you just neglect to mention that one. It was 24% of kids had seen their father. It, sorry, it wasn't hit. It was domestic violence. So that could have just been yelling at their mother. So mm. one in four children had seen that, their father to their mother. And that's that's what he said. But of course... 23% had also said they'd seen their mother do the exact same thing to the father. But, of course, that doesn't count. Yes. And right now in Australia, the, the campaigns that they're running are about attitudes towards women. It starts with um, respecting women. We have to respect women, which is strange when you even look at White Ribbon's own survey and you look at attitudes towards violence of the opposite sex. Now, I went and... I got the report. It's a hundred, a couple of hundred pages long, and and you get to the part of oh, okay. you get to the part with attitudes. I made a couple of videos on this actually. I called them an addendum to my um, domestic, the Australian domestic violence um, <clears throat> new campaign. And what you find when you have a look at the st statistics is that the attitudes of men towards hitting girls is actually not as bad as vice versa. So that's to say that. They were, you were given several scenarios. For example, it's okay to oh, yeah. to hit to hit your girlfriend or significant other when she throws something at you, and there was sort of and uh, there were sort of five or six of these, and they all sort of escalated from name calling through to throwing something or hitting you or something like that. And in each case, women's attitudes towards hitting men was worse than men's attitudes towards hitting women, but yet. Our campaign here in Australia right now is all about respecting women and men have to change their attitudes. When men actually have better attitudes towards violence against women than vice versa, that's what the statistical evidence says. The only So what you're effectively doing is giving women a free pass. Yeah, and um, you know the same thing has been going on in the UK and I don't know if you've seen a few stories out this year that, that domestic vi that violence by women towards men is up something like 500% in the last decade. That's reported cases. Mm. I didn't realize it was that much. Yeah. But I think the, one of the one of the issues with that is though that they have of course they've broadened the definition. And so male um, yeah. male um, incidences have also gone up not by as much. Maybe they've doubled I think in the last 10 years, but yeah, but women have it's up five times. And, of course, what do you expect in a culture that says men are always to blame, women are innocent, women are to be believed all the time? I mean, this is the outcome you're going to get. Women think yep. they can get away with it, and they can. And they're right. Yeah. If they think they can get away with it, in the vast majority of instances, they're correct. Yeah. Now, that legal case we were talking about a little while ago, there was the judges, the judge involved in it referred to a lot of ideological fluff really? and ignored Now, that's why it will be an easy case to appeal. Mm. But if it is not overturned in appeal, it is going to set a precedent where basically it says that ideology overrules facts at law. Mm. And this is why some of the notes that I've, 
I've been writing on YouTube mm. have been about the application of critical theory to the law. Yep. Um, Studio Brulee has featured a couple of these issues, but yep. I studied uh, in philosophy, I studied critical theory many years ago. And oh, the older just, I get... Just, just stop there for a second, sure. I just because people will be listening, and, and if, they ha if they don't know who Studio Brulee is... Um, he, he, oh, okay. He does, yeah, just just for other people's information. So, I think, do you remember his name? But I know that what it's, he does the Fiamenko files, which is Janice Fiamenko yes. out of out of Canada, which I think people should be familiar with. Janice Fiamenko. Yeah, um, Brulee is the producer, but it's really Janice Fiamenko who's the the major presenter. Yeah. Predominantly, they're on things to do with feminism, social justice, and apply in very applied areas. She complains all the time about a lot of the nonsense that goes on in universities yeah. and so forth. Yeah, it's, it's really great, and I, like, I thoroughly recommend people, and I'll put a link in the description so everybody can check that out. Yeah. Um, it's just that when I studied um, critical theory as a philosophy student in, what, second or third year or something, it wasn't presented as being a particularly important theory. It was just one theory out of, you know, quite a number. Yeah. And it came from the Frankfurt School in the post-war period um, from Germany. Yep. And there was a lot more weight given to, say, Immanuel Kant sure. rather than critical theory. But critical theory now seems to be dragging all of these disparate groups together because it's critical theory that is the basis for the idea of systemic oppression, mm -hmm. of unequal structures in society, but looking at it not... Okay, in critical theory, they don't look at you at an individual hmm. level. They look at where are you on an oppression stat. Sure. Well, you're white, male, so therefore you're at the top of the curve. So therefore, whatever happens is because of what you are, not who you are. Sure. Hmm. If you happen to be black female migrant who's got, you know, a various health problems and probably are some form of developmental disability or whatever, you're totally oppressed by society, so therefore it's society's yeah. job to make you, you know, push you up the stack. Mm. Now, a lot of that really came from critical theory, and it's dragging all of the social justice groups together, mm -hmm. the social and cultural Marxists, the feminists, the whiny children at universities, yep. um, Black Lives Matter, all of the groups that are looking at oppression, privilege from a systemic perspective, it's really critical theory that that way of thinking is rooted in. And there is no solution to it. Because it is systemic, mm. it is seen as being largely unchangeable. So therefore, there's nothing as an individual you can do about it. Mm. So if you're a black person in America and you're indoctrinated into BLM and the critical theory that is at least partly behind that, it's saying we're systematically oppressed, mm -hmm. we're being shot every day by white police, white people are out to get us and whatever. Mm. We can't do anything about it. We don't have any agency. We don't have any control over our own lives. Yep. Why, why make an effort? Exactly. It is, it's so, uh, I think, toxic, that kind of uh, mindset, isn't it? I mean, it, it's... It's uh, it's it's the victim narrative. It's so debilitating because why would you try? You've been told that you've been oppressed. There's nothing, as you said, nothing you can do about it. Um, and so, what do you do? You just you you can you never have to take responsibility for yourself. You can always blame that's right the system. Yep, and I've had this argument with quite a few senior people in Australian government. Hmm. And they'll make up silly things like saying, well, maybe you're just stronger than others. I've said, look, <laughs> that's got nothing to do with it. Mm. It's not about me. Yeah. You're saying, oh, society's got a lot to answer for and they do this and do that and this is wrong. And I said, look, you're just not helping. Yeah. You're saying to people it is okay to fail. It is okay to be mediocre. Yeah. It's okay to blame everyone else for your own problems. Mm -hmm. The first lecture, I'm going back over 40 years ago, the first lecture I ever had in first-year psych, the lecturer, the lecturer said, 
Um, and he actually opened a few people's eyes up. The whole basis of studying psychology is based on the concept of individual responsibility. Right. So when we talk about human cognition, we talk about behaviour, it's from the viewpoint of an individual is a sentient being and they're responsible for their own thoughts, feelings, actions. Sure. And a lot of people looked a little bit surprised. <laughs> but he, he spent some time creating the, the background to that. Mm. How can you study human behaviour if it's the fault of somebody we don't even know? Mm. Well, is, that's interesting, isn't it? And maybe you can maybe you can flesh this out a little bit more. But um, as my understanding, in, to go into um, psychiatric care or to seek psychiatric care, for example, is to if you have some kind of phobia or some problem or fear. Now, of course, the the psychologist's job is not to throw you into the deep end straight away, but gradually build you up to the point where you can confront that fear which is the complete opposite yes. of the way we're, we're on, at university campuses where we have safe spaces, for example, where the idea there is you never have to confront anything. And we're not even talking about real fears or phobias. We're just talking about opinions that you don't like or that you don't agree with or that you find makes you slightly emotional. And and the the answer for them is to just shield yourself off for the completely, not ever to build yourself to the point where you can engage with it, which it seems to be. It does. It does that ring true to you? Is that is that kind of? Oh, right absolutely. Hmm. Because even now, some academic psychologists are coming out and saying the safe space mentality is very, very harmful. Hmm. It's saying to people. Again, it's this narrative of critical theory where it's a systematic problem and you can't do anything about mm. it. I, it's like saying, I'm a weak person. Yeah. Now, the example you were talking about, about building yourself up, if you've got a phobia, mm. now just, just make up a phobia. Say you've got a phobia about cats. Mm -hmm. okay? um, now, that's quite an unusual one because cats generally don't run around and attack people. Mm. Um, what psychologists, at least the ones who went to uni when I did, you'd use things like systematic desensitization. Right. You'd start talking about cats and you'd go through a process. I mean, I once tried this with a, a relative who have, has a phobia about being in cars and driving. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I said, what you need to do is to take it one step at a time. When you feel comfortable with the first step and only at that point you move to the second. Yep. Now, You'll have some days where you're more confident the next. You might get three or four steps down the road one day and the next day you regress back to where you started from. Mm. But that is normal. You have to still try and make that step. Um, on a side issue, I've got no consultant in Australia. Mm. What he does now as a job is he teaches people in the workforce resilience. <laughs> now, this again is a new buzzword that popped up maybe 10 or 15 years ago. Yep. And the resilience is that you don't lose it if you hear something you don't like. Mm. You can put up with diversity of ideas. Mm. Now, 50 years ago, you would have been told in the workforce, maybe even if you were in the public sector, you would have been told, well, if you don't like it, really, that's just too bad. Yeah. Yeah. You have to put up with yeah. it. The organisation doesn't exist for your benefit. Yeah. But they're rapidly changing. You just see now that the safe space mentality has not only gone from universities, it has been in the public sector for some time. Right. We can't have anybody challenging our views. If you have a meeting with people in the public sector and you challenge their views, mm. they don't try and debate you. They get upset or they get angry. <laughs> or it, I can think of one client I had in... Uh, in Canberra, if you disagreed with you, if you said to her, I disagree with you, mm. she would literally throw a tantrum like a <laughs> two-year-old. You know, I thought this particular woman just needs to go into a safe space and never come out of it. She simply cannot cope mm. with any, any idea that doesn't come from her. Yeah. But 
that ideology, though, is a very closed way of thinking, is not just making people feeble-minded. It's making people dysfunctional. Yes, yeah. I think Milo... If you can't... I think sorry? Milo Yiannopoulos actually said at one point, he said he would love for these safe spaces to have a psychological evaluation. He said, I'm sure a lot of them have deep emotional issues. But where have those emotional issues come from? I th- yeah. Now, if you've got... Just as an example, if you've got a serious phobia... Mm. Generally, what's caused that, not always, but it's fairly common that what's caused that has been a bad experience, particularly when you were young. Yep. You might have, in fact, um, had a feral cat attack you when you were two years old and you got really upset about it and got scratches on you, and you're 50 years old now and you're still phobic about cats. Yep. But you can see what's happened is there's been some degree of trauma at a young age that the child hasn't recovered from. They haven't dealt with it in any rational way, Mm. and it just continues. But what I tend to be seeing with a lot of the safe space ideology is it's an an ideology that hasn't been caused by personal experiences. It's now an ideology that we're all victims. Yes. So they've talked themselves into it, essentially. Well... It's a bit like a cult mentality where you have in-group versus the out-group. Yep. And they genuinely believe, the social justice warriors as a group, genuinely believe that people who are not like them are bad. Yeah. Now, I've never accepted this idea of the left or the right politically, and I've never been in either box. Mm. Because... You go to the left and you become authoritarian. You go to the right too far and you become authoritarian too. So I don't support any particular um, party. I never have. In fact, I I don't even vote anymore in Australian elections, Mm -hmm. but I would often end up voting for minority parties or individual, you know, independent candidates. It's a little bit of a protest. But the safe space idea, it is from... Mm -hmm. I'm sure there's probably dozens of people as we speak writing PhD dissertations on it. Yeah. I just hope that somebody along the way actually does something good. (laughs) Um, Mm. Now, where a lot of those safe space idiots are going is they're leaving universities and then taking that into the workforce. Mm. Now, a lot of the women go into the workforce now in well-paid jobs, fairly cushy jobs in government. Yeah. Most women, even my old MBA class years ago, um, a lot of the women who are in my MBA class, I think there was probably a ratio of four or five males to each female. But on graduation, a lot of the women went into the public service. Because it, and they went in the role that had nothing to do with doing an MBA. Because this is where, I mean, that that ideology carries straight up. I mean, just have a look at what they're doing in the public service now. I mean, South Australia just came out with this program. I don't know if you've seen it. <clears throat> there was an ad uh, it was running on the internet uh, recently about how they want to get uh, women into leadership roles. And the whole thing is about rearranging the workplace around women. That That's all it is. Completely. Yes. And because you're in the public sector, so that there's no um, sort of time is money mentality. You don't have to worry about profitability or efficiency. And so the whole campaign... And you can't get sacked yeah, and, and unless you break a rule. Very difficult to get sacked. And the whole... Um, it has to be misconduct. Yeah. And the, the, the buzzword they were using throughout this thing, they must have said it 20 times, was flexibility. And flexibility, all that means is... A woman can be in a high executive position and yet she can still knock off at three and go and pick the kids up. That That's all it means. Yeah. That is all it means. And there was some throwaway line about, oh, and men can use this too, you know, if they want to go to football training or something, you know, which is usually at 6.30 in the evening anyway, if you've ever played football. But um, yeah. that, that's all it is. It is and, it, and they're talking about targeting women into leadership positions. And it's like, why is this happening? I mean, why aren't you? Surely you just want to be targeting good employees, regardless of gender. But it was all about targeting women into executive positions, giving them the flexibility and time off. Now, there's a certain 
I mean, we hear this all the time. They want quotas for boardrooms and all kinds of things. But the, the, basically, if it's when you reach a certain level, I mean, if you're in an executive position, especially at a at a publicly listed company, not a uh, uh, not a government organization, as an executive, you need to put in 50, 60, 70 hours a week. And at some point, your mm-hmm. flexible lifestyle, all that's going to mean is that you're going to delegate your duties to people who are more junior than you. And you're going to sit there and take a nice, cushy, uh, well-paying job and be not particularly useful. But that's the way... Well, I can give you a, I can give you a very simple example of that where um, work-life balance means somebody else has to do half your job for them. Yeah, exactly. Um, because I've worked in relatively... I've never worked in the corporate sector. I never really wanted to because I really don't want to get involved in politics. Mm. But at a company that I was one of the founders of um, in the early 90s, one of the other founders um, was actually a very nice woman, and I still say hello to her every now and again now, but she inadvertently got pregnant. She, I think she might have been about 30 at the time mm. and she wasn't planning on having children at that point in time. But anyway, she got pregnant. When the baby was leading up to the birth and when the baby was born, I mean, she did virtually no work for probably 12 months. Right. The few bits and pieces of work that she did, everyone else had to redo. Right. So in a small office, the, the males including myself, ended up having to carry the workload. Hmm. Now, she could get away with that being female. Um, I wouldn't have been able to. And in fact, had it not been for the other people there to carry the workload, it was a new company we formed in the middle of the Australian recession in 1991, which was a really tough time economically. So we got a new company up and running with very limited money and then we had the issue of dealing with one of the original founders who basically disappeared for 12 months. Right. And after that came back and worked part-time because it just wasn't a tenable situation. Mm. So um, when people talk to me about work-life balance, I'm sorry I'm a little bit cynical. Yeah, I am too. Because I've been in a situation where I've had to pick up the load where somebody else has had work-life balance, and I sure as hell didn't have yeah. it. Well, I mean, I can, you know, I, was, I can speak from experience. I worked in a stockbroking operation. Now, that, if you're, unless you're at a top-tier firm, but I was in a mid-tier firm, and they run very lean. And if you're not pulling your weight, you are out. That's it. It is easily measurable by your output in a stockbroking operation. I worked in research, and generally there's... There's corporate, there's the dealing oh, yeah. desk, and there's research. So I did, you know, you should buy this, you should sell that, you should hold this. Um, now, there was, let's say there was a media analyst, and there was, we had a media analyst. She was a woman, she was a journalist before she became the media analyst. Now, she would, she was by herself, and she had one assistant, like everybody else. And if she didn't put mm-hmm. out, you know, uh, regular research, she was gone. And she actually, she was actually okay, but she quit because she couldn't handle it after six months. And actually, most of the women that yeah. I work with in stockbroking quit because it was just too, it's too um, intense for them. Um, and there's just nowhere to hide in an operation like that. You just can't hide. And if you would even ask somebody, you can't really ask someone to cover because if your specialization is media, you can't ask the retail analyst to cover media because he doesn't know, doesn't know what he's doing. So you have to. That's right. Yeah, I yeah. mean, it, there's just nowhere to hide, and um, it's it, it's no surprise that women don't go into those jobs very often. Some of them do, and some of them do it very well, but a lot of them don't. And and that's even going back to the late seventies, the situation was quite similar. Mm. Because working in social welfare areas, a lot of the people going into it think it's going to be all warm and fuzzy. Right. It's the exact opposite. Yeah. We would get violent clients. We would get clients with diseases. Mm. We would get people who were stoned and we were having to resuscitate them on the floor <laughs> before we could get an ambulance to turn up and give them Novocaine or something. But we get one crisis after another. That's all we did. Mm. 
That's why we were there. We were a crisis centre and we got every known crisis. Now, the staff turnover was fairly high yep. and the average age was quite young. Mm. Um, and you work long hours for relatively low pay. Yep. And that's why people will normally do it for a fixed period of time and often they'll move on. Yep. But we had a lot of people going there, particularly a lot of young women going there, thinking it was going to be a bit like some sort of fairy tale social worker role. Yeah. And they just could not handle mm. it. They would just be in tears at the end of each day. Mm. You know, the staff, there's a perception, I think, um, in probably middle class society that the people who work in social welfare are like, um, TV social workers. Right. They're not like that at all. The ones that have been in it for more than a short period of time are generally very tough people because they have to yep. be. You know, the safe space people we talked about at universities would not last there until lunchtime. No. They literally would be a wreck after the first five minutes. Well, I, I despair. I, mean, did, I think you brought up Yale before. I mean, what about um, Yale wanted trigger warnings on... Um, this was for law, for law students, yeah. on the word rape. Uh, now, if if you're going to go into criminal law and you you know sexual assault, you're going to come across cases like that. I mean, the idea that you should be shielded from that word as a law student doing criminal law is absolutely absurd. I mean, how are you, go how are you going to cope? Not... In the, how are you going to cope in the real world? But even if you're not going to become a lawyer. And if you fall to pieces because somebody mentions a word, whether it's rape or anything else, yeah. um, it's just, again, this point I was talking about, about resilience, mm. um, we, we develop new industries to cope with first world problems. And that's a very good example. Yep. Um, there was one of the guys that is involved in Breitbart, not Milo. Um, I'm trying to think of the name of the guy. Um, the founder? Or who no, did? he's a young Jewish guy. Hmm. I'm trying to remember his name. He has his own website, but he gets quoted all the time. Um, he is quite brilliant hmm. on this issue. I'll send you a link later when I. Oh, I think has he been on? Has he been on podcasts with Milo before? And he's got dark hair. Yes, yes I know. Uh, yes. Alan Vakari. Vakari, is that his name? No. no. Um, I'll move on, but the overall theory of what he's saying is that a lot of these people that want to hide in safe spaces and can't listen to any word or idea that offends them, mm. part of the issue is nothing in their life has ever been bad. That's right, yeah. They have not experienced hardship. Mm -hmm. yep. Now, I'll just give you an example. Both my parents died when I was in school. Mm. My father died when I was... It was during the holiday period between fifth and sixth grade. Right. Um, and my mother died when I was 17, would have been the year I did the HSC. Yep. So I worked part-time since I was 15. I was totally self-supporting when I finished school. Mm -hmm. Now, if I say that to young people now, they go, oh, how terrible. Mm. How on earth did you cope? Yep. Well, I coped because I didn't have any choice. Yeah, you had to. Just got on with it. <laughs> what is... You cope as well as you yep. can. That's right. And this is the point where the people mentally are so soft. Mm. Just an anecdote, what I was saying before about China. There's a saying now in China where the millennials are being called the strawberry generation. <laughs> this is not the, the generation that grew up with the Great Leap Forward, no. with um, you know Mao's Little Red Books, the Cultural Revolution, anything like that. Yeah. Now... What happened during um, the Cultural Revolution is if you were a, a self-employed businessman, your business would be shut down and it would be confiscated. Your house would be um, stolen by the state and you would be kicked out. Yep. And if you're lucky, they might find share accommodation for you somewhere else. But everything you owned would be stolen by the state. Yep. And those people survived because they didn't have any choice. A lot of them were killed mm. because they were denounced as being, you know, like enemies of the people's struggle. If you ever go to Shanghai, there's actually a good propaganda museum there. Mm. 
with full of posters and imagery and so forth. It's just the process of indoctrination. But it's also, it, it put people against each other. Mm. And the same thing happened in the communist era in um, Eastern Europe. I've been travelled quite a lot through Eastern Europe and you see exactly the same process right. where individuals right. spied on each other, they ratted on each other, and individuals, even within a family group, spied on each other and denounced each mm. other. But you have now what they call the strawberry generation who are growing up in middle-class families now in China where you've had enormous growth in wealth in the last 20 or 30 years. So the kids that are now going to uni have got relatively well-off parents. Um, they didn't have to live with starvation, disease, um, and all of the deprivations of the communist era. Although it's still a communist country, um, it operates as a mixed economy. Yeah. And the funny thing now about China is the size of the public sector on a relative basis is 28% of the economy. Right. That right. is significantly lower than just about every Western country. Yeah, that's... In America now, it's 42%. Yeah, it's stunning. I think we're in the... We're, we're, we're more than a third, aren't we, I think? I think Australia was about 36% yeah. when I last yeah. looked. It might be a little bit more than that. But there are a lot of economies in Western Europe where over 50% of the economy is the public sector. Yep. So it's moved from, it's not capitalism, and it's, it's moving from a mixed economy more toward a socialist economy. Yep. So, and that's happening every year. I remember even when I was in high school, um, there was a bit of a debate going on, you know, with people like Milton Friedman and so forth, complaining that... Um, the size of the public sector was 22% in the early 70s. Right. And then I would have been in high school. So Milton Friedman at that time was arguing that the size of the public sector in the United States is getting out of hand. Mm. It's now 42%. So what happens is in a lot of countries, the, the private sector is shrinking and the public sector is getting progressively larger. Yeah. And in the States, if you look at it on a graph, it increases about half a percent each year. So it's gone from 22% to um, 42% since the early 70s. Mm. They don't, and, and, and somehow they're un unable to put that together with the fact that the US, the last decade, has seen the worst GDP growth rate in, their, in, the, in modern history for the US. It's about half of the growth rate for the preceding 50 years. Uh, and 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 the U.S. is doing better than most of Europe. Europe is a disaster. Mm. Economically, the unemployment rate in a lot of, particularly in southern um, southern Europe, countries like um, Greece, Italy, Spain, Portugal. Um, oh, and Eastern Europe is a nightmare. Mm. Um, places like you know Kosovo and so forth, unemployment's like forty five, fifty percent. Mm. And there's, if you talk to people in government there, mm. um, and I've got a few European friends here in Singapore that have been involved in it, mm. and you talk to them and mm. the attitude of government is the only thing they can ever see to solve the problems is more government. Mm. Like um, the problem might be, for example, the private sector is not investing enough in R&D mm. because a lot of R&D now is being moved to Asia. Right. So the solution, therefore, is to force the, to force the private sector to spend more money on R&D. That's the stupid narrative and the only narrative they understand. Everything is about coercion. Yeah, central planning. And then they wonder why it's not working. It hasn't worked for the last 30 or 40 yeah, most, years. I mean, if you took out Germany... In Switzerland, out of Europe, I mean, you basically have a moribund uh, continent that just it has a zero growth rate. Um, you know, Spain, Portugal, disasters. Well, Italy's not much better. Greece, of course, is a basket case. France is barely growing. Um, yeah. The UK's a little um, better. The UK is not too bad, but it has... Major areas like in the north and some of the industrial areas around the Midlands mm. that are a disaster. 
Yeah. Um, I spent some time in the UK just before Brexit. You weren't you weren't and in um, you, were in you weren't in Nottinghamshire by any chance, were you? No, I avoided it because <laughs> <laughs> you don't want to don't want to run into a woman up there, or look at one or approach one with the new. No, laws. you'll be arrested. Yeah. And if you say hello and she doesn't like the way you say hello, hate crime. Um, it's seen as hate speech. Yeah. yeah. Um. But the mentality, the dependence upon government in Europe is quite amazing. Mm. It's just seemed to be assumed that, um, look, one of the issues that I found crazy with Brexit, when you talk to the young people over there, they actually think that the government runs everything. No, no, yeah, it's awful. If it's not for the government, we won't be able to trade. Yeah, that's well, stunning. <laughs> stunning lack of historical knowledge and, and just the way, and basic knowledge of how the economy works. I mean, you don't need a government to enter into free trade deals. Companies do it all the time. <laughs> they don't. They don't require the yep. government to do it. Uh, yes, and they don't actually want the government telling them what to do. Nah. Too. But you know, I mean, really, there's an awful lot of crony capitalism now in Europe, mm. and I had mixed feelings about the Brexit. Um, yeah. But I have absolutely no love of the EU because it's just this another uh, enormous bureaucracy yeah. that is unaccountable, totally inefficient. Um, I read some of its economic works, mm. you know, how did, things like what we can do to try and solve the problems of youth unemployment in Europe, which is a massive problem. Mm. In most, if you look at the EU zone as a total, unemploy, youth unemployment is like 50% or more in a large proportion of countries in the EU, mm. particularly in the southern areas. They released, when was it? It would have been about three or four months ago. They released this paper on what they're going to do about youth unemployment. And I read it, and again, I wanted to go and headbutt a mm. wall. It is just this so naive motherhood full of endless platitudes and how they're going to work with local authorities. And it was all about the only way of solving the problem is to increase government spending. Mm. Um, if you look at any solution to economic problems, generally they work better when you do the exact opposite, yep. where you actually put buying power in people's hands, you actually give people choices, and you reward efficiency and not bureaucracy. That's right. Well, that's why the EU is um, is really the ultimate uh, destination that social justice warriors want to get to, which is some overarching body that interferes and regulates every part of your life. And it is the lifeblood of the economy. And and this. Uh, but the crazy thing is, people believe. Yeah, it. that's what the, the, I keep saying this constantly. That it's a lack of historical knowledge about how an economy prospers. And the only reason we have such huge public sectors and uh, welfare states that we have today is because we can afford it. Because we became prosperous, not through the welfare state. I mean, they've got the causality exactly backwards. You don't get prosperity through the welfare state, through government interference. You get it precisely from the opposite way. And this is what's so frustrating. Um, now, I was only in a, a school when I when Hawke came into power in Australia. Now, they were a... Yeah, they, okay. they set up social programs like Medicare, for example. But they also recognized mm -hmm. that business was the engine of growth for an economy. And they deregulated, they brought down tariffs, they floated the dollar. I mean, they cut taxes. Yes. I mean, they did all of those things. And that was a Labor government. That was they a left-wing... more competition in banking. Absolutely. They actually did stuff that was more, not libertarian, but relatively liberal. It's actually... You know, from an Australian It's perspective. actually what used to be called progressive. But today, progressive is just... That doesn't mean anything anymore. It's actually... Regressive, and I think Mark Latham said it best when he said that the Labor Party today, in 2016, in Australia, reflects the Labor Party of the 1960s, which is high protectionism and big government solutions, which we know doesn't work. But somehow, again, they've just lost any sense of historical context. I don't know if they don't know this, that they're completely bereft of historical knowledge, or that they're just, you know, they've just... Uh, it's just pure politics. Well, 
again, it's a bit like the argument of the wage gap when you have people like Turnbull and Barack Obama mm. who go out and saying, you know, women only make 77 cents to the dollar or whatever number they bandy around. Now, most people that would read any of these sort of anti-social justice sites, they've probably read Warren Farrell's novels on why men earn more. Yep. They've probably watched, you know, various... Christina Hoff YouTube Simons, clips. for example. I mean, there's a yeah. perfect... Uh, she gives, you know, her... What, what is it? Uh, I forget what it's called, but, it, you know, six to seven minutes and she just debunks it beautifully. Yep. Yeah. And she just gives examples where have just have a look at areas like medicine. Mm. Uh, women tend to go into the less demanding areas of family medicine, general practice. Men tend to go into the very demanding areas like surgeons. Yep. There are very, very few female surgeons, but there are an awful lot of female GPs. Yep. So when they're comparing one with the other, it's not even a fair comparison. No. Um, they tried to do that here in Australia too, the uh, Gender Equality Agency, another government boondoggle here in Australia. Oh, yeah. Um, they came out with a um, report last year, and then they came out with a bigger, more fleshed out report this year. And their whole thing was, uh, you know, it's 24 cent to the dollar uh, wage gap. Now, buried in about page nine, it says. Bear mm -hmm. in mind, this does not compare like for like. But then they go on to say throughout the whole report... And compare like for like. Yeah, and, and they, they do yeah. not compare like for like at all. And so they come up with statistics like, oh, we've broken it down by industry and women get paid something like, you know, 30% less in banking. and twenty. The thing is, as I relayed to you before, I worked in stockbroking. Now, the majority of the women working in stockbroking when I was there were secretaries. Yeah. They were the women who typed up the reports, they were the ones who formatted everything to make sure that when the daily went out the next day, the daily uh, stock market newsletter, mm. that it all looked nice. There were no women. There was like, as I said to you, there was one woman research analyst who was a media analyst. Then there was about 20 other guys, um, secretaries. There was a human resource manager. So, but And what they do in Australia, this gender equality agency, they've lumped in. So banking and finance, for example, you've got dealer, yeah. you know, Dealers, foreign, foreign exchange dealers, high stress job, that earn big money, and they're being put up against the secretary in the research department, and they collate all this and go, oh look, there's a thirty percent difference of what people are getting paid, and they're trying to say that because they're broken it down by industry, they're comparing like for like, and they're not, they're not at all. Well, again, if they look at recent data, if they look at university graduates. Mm -hmm. Um, young females in most Western countries are now being paid more than young males. Yep. And part of that is the fact that on about a three to two basis throughout the Western world, you're getting more university graduates who are female. Yep. And the education system in all the years, in the 36 years I've been involved in the tertiary sector, um, progressively it's become feminised in how teaching occurs. Mm. Just as an example, when I first started um, at university, well, I don't know, when I did the HSC, 100% of the assessment was based on the final exam. Right. Not now. So I don't know if it's like that well, I did the, I did the HSC in 1991 and okay. that was, what was it then? It was 50-50, 50, 50, 50 coursework, uh -huh. 50 exam. Hmm. Well, a large portion now of university courses are predominantly assignment essay driven right. and a lot of it is group work. Um, so not only do they not have very many exams, they often have very limited amount of individual work. Yeah. That's another word that's I think so be used is this collaboration. Because I've worked in plenty of environments where we were supposed to collaborate and it just turns into a complete shit fight. People get more accomplished on their own a lot of the time. And of course collaboration suits the female style of learning and men are more sort of narrow yes. focused. Now, if you study the way the male and female brain work, connectivity, mm. neural connectivity in the male and female brain are not the same. Mm. What you get in the male brain is you get more connectivity from the front of the brain to the back. From women, with women, you get more connectivity across the two hemispheres. Yep. Now, the parts of the male brain that are more active 
and the form of connectivity gives them better analytical abilities. Yet with women, it gives them more verbal abilities and communication-like abilities. Mm. Now, theoretically, um, simply the way the male versus female brain works, it is going to have an effect on what things they like to do. Yep. Now, there's, even when I was at uni as a first-year student, there were plenty of people do, you know, plenty of females doing physics and maths and chemistry and so forth. Yep. Yet there was, even then, I'm going back over 40 years ago, there was this big movement, we must get more women in sciences and STEM fields. Yep. Okay. Now, the funny thing is, all the women who now say we must get more women in STEM courses are women who do communications <laughs> or gender exactly. studies or some other Mickey Mouse course. Mm. Um, you know, I mean, I don't think anybody had had ever heard of gender studies when I first started at uni. But I even then, I did do a subject which was called the philosophy of women, right. um, which morphed later into gender studies right. as it sort of got a bit more like a giant hydra that kept growing well, heads. Well, yeah, and, and the problem with this that particular gender studies, uh, just as a broad sort of academic subject, I think Janice Fiamenko is very good on this, that it, it's... It's so um, internally referenced, and that is to say that everyone who peer reviews research for their journals all believes the same thing. There's no uh, criticism. There's no diversity of opinion. You have to have the right opinion or you don't get published and you don't get positions um, in faculty. There's even a bigger problem. You won't get funded. Hmm. You only get funded to do things that are sexy. Right. So anything that's seen as being outside of the narrative of that particular body, I'm not saying all the bodies are the mm. same, but there's endless fighting that goes on over what will be funded and what mm. isn't. Um, and having, having done research on government grants over the years, including things like I probably did the biggest... Uh, research project on the economic impact of immigration that the federal government ever funded. Mm. That was quite some years ago. Um, and the agency that was actually the client was morphed back into some other agency probably 20 years ago. But again, you get things that are funded which are populist at the time. Mm. So if you want to look at pure sciences, there's a dearth of funding, particularly in Australia in science. It's not seen as something that anyone really wants to know about. And the attitude often in Australian government is there's so much research done overseas in science, we don't need to do it. <laughs> so we end up being idea takers generally from overseas, which is why R&D mm. in Australia is generally no more than quality control. Yeah, it's pretty, it's pretty lacklustre. And, and, it's, it's in, yeah. and then you have the government running around talking about smart cities and being a science and technology hub, but it's all just... Um, platitudes. And there's no real substance there. Uh, there are no real ideas of how to get it off the ground. It's it's kind of sad because, I mean, they've been talking about this for years, but it's actually be coming to the fore because we we're on the downward uh, part of the cycle for the resources boom, and we we don't really have yeah. anything to take up the slack. I mean, we've been lucky in recent years, um, contrary to what all the uh, the fear monger has said is that the weather's been relatively good and our um, agricultural products have held up really well. Um, but the yeah. next drought we have, and we'll have one, and we don't have the resources boom, and we, we could be in real trouble. And as someone, I thought, oh, who was it? I was on Alan Jones the other night or something, said that we've had two, uh, oh, I think we've had a year of negative income growth. So while the economy's been growing, people's wages have been mm -hmm. going backwards. We actually have a recession in wages in Australia. And that's and that's why the economy is doing relatively well on a global basis. Well, basic incomes in Australia, though, are very high. Mm. In fact, a lot of what we'd call in Australia low-income jobs, they will still get paid probably two or three times what they'd get paid in Europe or the US. Yeah. Now... If you work, say you've got a part-time job in a supermarket in Singapore. Mm. Um, Singapore is 
a popular place for expats, but it is not a cheap place to live. Yeah. Not at all. Um, accommodation costs here are phenomenal. Here and in Hong Kong, they're just, and also in some of the major centres in um, Japan, they're just unbelievable. Oh, yeah. You can pay $8,000 a month to rent an apart, a little apartment. Oh, in Tokyo, yeah. I, I lived in Tokyo for a few years. Yeah. Uh, Tokyo's absolutely... Oh, okay. Tokyo's ridiculous. I mean, people... You can pay... Um, you can pay probably a couple of thousand dollars a month just for a car park in Tokyo, just for a place to park your car that's not even necessarily near where you live. <laughs> you, you, you might have that car park where you, and then you have to get out and walk 10 minutes to your apartment and you pay 150,000 yen for it uh, a month, which is about 2,000 Australian dollars. It's, it's, it's nuts. Hmm. Um, I've also spent... A fair bit of my time in Europe, probably in the last decade or so, um, and I see the social justice movement, it's even more contaminated in Europe than I think it is in Australia mm. and in um, the US. Yep. Now, um, if you talked about immigration, I was, even in the UK, yep. people will tell you, don't talk about immigration because you'll be arrested. <laughs> okay? You don't have to say... Look, if you said something like, I want to kill all immigrants, mm. I'd understand it. But you only have to talk about the topic. Yeah. You don't have to elaborate. You only have to say, you know, oh, gee, I see so many migrants these days when I go to the shops. Yeah. Something like that is almost seen as sedition. Yeah. Well, you see, I mean, I don't know. Did you see the survey last week here in Australia about... Um, Muslim immigration and and uh, an official polling company asked the question, do you support a, a ban on Muslim immigration? That was the question. And 49% of Australians said yes, they support it. 40% said they do not. And 11% were un undecided. So even if you only get a couple of percent of the undecideds, you have a majority of Australians who support a ban on mm -hmm. Muslim immigration. And you should have seen the left media try and grapple with this oh. because what the left doesn't and I, I say left but i mean you know who i'm talking about i'm talking about the abc i'm talking about sbs i'm talking about all the sort of the guardian newspapers online all of those types of news agencies the, the drum on tv mm. um these they just couldn't cope with it and there was people running around the internet saying oh they only surveyed a thousand people oh, and yeah. you know it's like these people obviously don't know how surveys are done. They just, oh, we didn't ask everybody in Australia. You, you don't. I mean, do, does, do they even know how the A... How oh, error margin... Yeah, do they know how the ABS error margin. Uh, does unemployment statistics? They don't ring, every, ring everybody up in the country and ask them if they're employed. I mean, they, they know. I went to the website. I looked at how they do the survey. They do take a proper cross-section of the country. They, you know, it has a 95% confidence interval. Um, it, it, it's a perfectly valid survey. But the left, yeah. I mean, my point was that the left absolutely lost it. They just couldn't grapple with this because what they still can't understand is that this is largely of their own making because they have, as you were saying, they have stifled debate on this. You can't talk about it. And if you do, you're a racist, you're a bigot, you're an Islamophobe, and, you know, you're just shamed into silence. And this reaction and this whole, oh, I don't like Pauline Hanson. I don't support her views. No, not at But um, they have to take responsibility for her popularity. It's precisely because the left have become so strident and arrogant and told everyone to shut up. You can't, this is not even up for debate anymore. Because it's not about ideas anymore. It's about... It's about an ideology, and you must believe it. All you mm. know, and in this case, it is um, cultural relativism. That there's no such thing as a better culture or a more advanced culture, or that or people come from cultures that are more um, share the same type of values that we share. Well, it's a bit like saying if we still live in caves, it's just as good as living in a air conditioned house. <laughs> it's about as brainless as that. Um, are you familiar with the Rotherham case, Rotherham. which is near, which is in Yorkshire, Not sh where there was oh the pack raping that was kept out of, is that the one? But yes, it was more than rape; it was sexual trafficking, mm. 
um, sex slavery. And the reports that were done indicated there were thousands of young girls involved. Now, most of them were minors, yep. you know, girls like 12, 13 years old who were being trafficked. Yep. Um, they were literally being sold into the sex, you know, sex, uh, sex slaves. And all the people involved in it were Pakistani. That's right, Pakistan. Yeah. So they yeah. were Pakistani. I actually Muslims. downloaded the official report now, of that. I haven't. I've only read the sort of the forward. Yeah, report. I read it some time ago. But despite the fact that that is now public knowledge, mm. how, only a very small number of people were ever charged. The clearly there was corruption going on when you have it at that yep. level. There were one or two people that were forced to resign, but nobody was prosecuted. And what I'm now reading now, and people actually told me this even when I was in the UK, is that the situation is worse now. If if no better, it's actually probably worse now than um, it was when that report was done. Yeah, it doesn't surprise me. And you know, you and that almost brings us back to where we started yeah. from, because that is violence against children. Mm-hmm. It is rape, sexual trafficking, serious abuse of young children, particularly girls, and they're blocked out completely. Nobody cares. Yeah. But we are. But we're all concerned the, about approaching a woman, and she doesn't like it, and that's a hate crime. That's what we're concerned with, but not uh, trafficking child sex slaves. It's it's stunning. Yeah, it's just, you know, we want to. We want everyone to go and hide in their safe space and we don't want to hear the rape, the word rape uh, because it might upset somebody. But we don't care the fact that in, just in Rotherham alone there are thousands of young girls who were raped, trafficked, sold into the sex industry, you name it, forced into brothels. Uh, they were often taken from their homes and relocated. Their parents had no idea where they were and they were in a complete panic. The police didn't help Mm. them and the police if the parents tried to get the girls back from where they were staying the parents were arrested (laughs) so it has become that crazy there's a few i've watched a few um youtube clips on it some time ago and then i actually did read some some parts of the report but even when i was in the uk a few months ago people were saying even then that look um, it's all very well to have these inquiries and reports, but all they ever do really is just, you know, a bit of a charade. We we have an inquiry so that everyone will think the problem's gone away. Yeah. And even now The Guardian, which is very politically correct, has actually publicly come out and said the problem hasn't gone away. <laughs> you know? Yeah, well, that's what happens. The Guardian is pretty crazy, a bit like The New York Times. Yeah. I look up the New York Times just out of interest, and I just shake my head and and just believe sometimes. Yeah, well, I, uh, if I if I know there's a social justice uh, story out concerning Australia, just go to the Guardian Online Australia. They'll have it. They'll have it in spades. They have all. It's it's just a mirror image mm. of the UK Guardian. They just pick up the stories and re- republish them under uh, Guardian Australia. Yeah, one of the reasons though that I've I've raised the issue with Rotherham, mm. and I don't know if the people listening are familiar with it, but they really just need yeah. to look up some articles on it, just put it in a search mm. engine. Um, it's in uh, Yorkshire, so it's a town not too far from York, and I was actually in York you know, only a few months mm. ago. The main point I'm making about it is this issue with feminism and social justice, children don't mm. count. This rebranding of domestic violence as violence against women is not just a way of saying we don't want to look after men because men is bad, women is mm. good. You know, that sort of simple truism. Yep. Children don't matter either. No. And that's been one of the really sad things where um, social justice warriors think they're saving the world and they don't give a shit about children. Nope. That I really don't follow. I can understand it from a feminist position because that's pushing the rights and the privileges of women, not of children. So even if they're female children, they don't seem to care. And certainly all the reports on Rotherham said that being PC 
is more important than protecting the lives of children. Yeah, that's it's just it's a stunning amount of cowardice, I think. Mm. And blatant hypocrisy. Mm. So I don't know how long this nonsense will go on for, but what's happened is with the growth of the public sector um, throughout the Western world, we've also had the growth of lobby groups. Yeah. We've had the growth of um, academic feminism and social justice in universities mm. and in education. The education system now is largely run by women. Yeah. Um, the government sector is now largely being controlled by women because women traditionally want to go into the you know white collar easy jobs in government where they contract out the real work to, to often people like me. The example I gave you of doing work on domestic violence um, to win that contract, I had to get women involved and I had to signed declarations about, you know, we agree with all affirmative action policies <laughs> of government and all this. Now, I owned 100% of the yeah. company. You know, it had one other employee at the time. Um, and I largely worked through networks. Mm. But I had to get women who were, you know, like people I used to work with and so forth, um, involved in the project because they had to see female faces at right. meetings. And they actually had to do some of the talking, despite the fact I might have to kick them under the table. So what I'm saying is um, it's distorting the way the public, the private sector works yeah. too. You cannot get government contracts if you don't side with all of their AA policies and can show that there are females who um, are involved in the management, not just in the sweeping the streets, but actually in the management mm. of the company. Yeah. So... It's not, you know, I'd like to think, okay, if we could just go beyond the academic sector and the public sector, we can't because the private sector now has been sucked into the same mindset. Oh, yeah. In Europe, it's even worse. The private sector now won't do anything without being told what to do by the government. Now, because diversity is such an obsession in America, um, you could imagine being a small business. Now... If you are running a small business, most of the time you're broke. Mm. Small businesses normally work on cash flow. Yep. They can't really put themselves in a situation of borrowing tens of millions of dollars because they don't, they don't generate enough cash yeah. to be able to repay it. So I was listening to Rand Paul, um, one of the American Republicans, yeah. complaining about a lot of moves of the federal government now to prosecute small to medium businesses without even a complaint. Okay? So what would happen previously if you were, say, um, a Latino or black and you'd say, I was discriminated against, I applied for the job at this corner store, you know, I was only going to be, you know, um, a cashier or something like this at the local supermarket, whatever it is, but I was discriminated against because yeah. I'm black. If there was a report, they would, the government would, there'd be some sort of due process to investigate it. Um, what Rand Paul was making a fuss about is what Obama's government is now pushing is that they will investigate things that are not even reported. <laughs> so you have a situation in which um, the the person, the applicant who was not given the job doesn't think that they were discriminated yep. against. The employer doesn't think that they discriminated against anybody. And if they take a law case against them, I would say in a large proportion of cases, those companies will be forced out of business. They will just yep. shut down. They can't afford a few hundred thousand dollars in legal fees. And the other thing, they can't afford 12 or 18 months of law cases which would be so disruptive to the business, they just have to shut it anyway. It's just this social justice craziness. And a lot of this, again, is critical theory. Mm. I didn't realise 40-odd years ago that I would see the underpinnings of critical theory just infect every part of society, and we are. It's, become, it's not socialism. It's actually critical yeah. theory. Yeah. It does have its roots in Marxist socialism, mm. but 
it it has a different mindset. And while socialism is much more about the economy, critical theory covers everything. It's not just the economy. It's also how politics works. It's how the private sector works. It's how our society works. And it's much more all-encompassing because Marxist socialism was really about, you know, the proletariat versus the bourgeoisie and so mm. forth. It was about the battle of labour, the ownership of capital versus labour. And it was more of an economic issue. Critical theory covers everything from politics, economics, how societies work, social groups, mm. you name it. And that's where a lot of this craziness of um, oppression, systematic um, privilege, you know, like the oppression mm. stack, um, all of this stuff comes largely from critical theory. And I never, starting it years ago, I never thought I'd be seeing it every day. Yep. Uh, it's funny how things come back around, isn't it? You live long enough, yep, you live long right. enough, and you see uh, things you thought were dead and buried come back around again. Well, I don't necessarily think society changes in the way it thinks. I, I'm sure that maybe in another generation or so, society will become relatively conservative, yeah. and it has yeah. to. If it doesn't, it will just implode. Yeah, it has to, yeah. Um, not only will it be an economic disaster, it's going to be such a social disaster. Mm. It's going to be like, you know, some dysphoria out of a, you know, an Orwell oh, novel. Yeah. Um, what Orwell didn't know about was how technology and social media and so forth is going to cha- reshape mm. the world. But without that, we wouldn't probably wouldn't have even had third wave, fe- third wave feminism. That really started to ride on the back of changes in technology. Mm. And that's why it became so much better organised. Well, on that uh, on that happy note, I think yep. we uh, might leave it there. Okay. And, um, okay. Well, good yeah, to talk. Yeah, I think it was good, and I think uh, the audience will uh, enjoy this and get get a lot out of it. So, uh, as usual, everybody, leave your comments below, and if you want more of this, maybe we can get Mark back on at a different time. If you have questions, maybe Mark would be kind enough to uh, come in the comments and give a few answers. Okay. Yep. No worries. Thanks a lot, Mark. Thanks a lot. Signing off. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.